as I said, my name is Courtney Hart. I'm the member advisor for Fractured Atlas and welcome to uh, crowdfunding for your artistic practice. Uh, today we'll talk about uh, crowdfunding and how you can use it to help fund your work and build a network of supporters. This is a brief overview of, of what our webinar is gonna cover today. Um, so feel free again to ask questions um, and to understand what we're gonna do. So we'll introduce crowdfunding. We'll talk about what it is, why we use it and so on. Um, then we'll move into um, all of our other things. But first, I just wanna give you a brief overview of what Fractured Atlas is. We are a nonprofit technology company that works with artists and arts organizations in all different disciplines all across the country. We offer a variety of programs and services that help artists strengthen the business side of their practice. Our four core programs are fiscal sponsorship, which helps artists raise charitable donations from individuals, corporate sponsors, and grantors, to our insurance program, uh, which helps artists uh, minimize their own risk and liability, um, artfully, which is a web-based software application that helps artists sell tickets and take donations and track fans, and SpaceFinder, which is an online marketplace that helps artists find performance and rehearsal space. Through these programs, uh, we work with more than 66,000 members, um, around 4,000 fiscally sponsored projects. Those products have raised uh, more than $129 million. We have bound 17,000 insurance policies um, and have served a community of over 5,000 artists all across the country. And just to give you a brief interview of, overview of who I am, uh, like I said, my name is Courtney. Um, I've worked at Fractured Atlas for three years and I'm the member advisor here. Um, it's my job to help members navigate our services and help uh, grow their arts businesses. I'm also a theater producer and director who runs their own company, Colloquy Collective. Um, I focus uh, primarily on producing historical works by women of color. Um, so not only do I work as an administrator, but I am an, a, a a producing artists um, who uh, tries to enact a lot of these best practices that I'm going to try to provide for you. So what is crowdfunding? Um, crowdfunding is simply the act of many people contributing money to a product in exchange for a good or service. So it's asking your crowd, people you know, to give you money in service of the work you're doing. Um, they can get goods or services in return. Um, which can get a little complicated when you're crowdfunding uh, through fiscal sponsorship. However, it's important to focus on what's simple about it. It is many people contributing money to a project in exchange for a good or service. So what's fiscal sponsorship? How does that connect to what we're talking about? Well, fiscal sponsorship is a tool that is ideal for individual artists trying to seek support for arts practices, um, a new or small arts organization that seeks a training wheels period before you're deciding if you want your own nonprofit status, or for-profit arts enterprises that seek to use both investors who plan to share in the profits of your work and nonprofit donors who want to make a tax deductible donation. The mechanism of fiscal sponsorship is such that a donor institution makes their contribution directly to the 501c3 organization. So in our case, a donor who wanted to support your work would make a credit card donation on our website or write a check out to Fractured Atlas. We would then issue that donor a tax receipt and hold the donation in a fund restricted for your project's use. You would then request the funds from us and we would disperse them to you in the form of a grant. Those are the basics of fiscal sponsorship. You can definitely learn more on our website or our intro to fiscal sponsorship webinar, um, which I will show you, I will talk to you about accessing uh, at a later date. So why should you crowdfund, right? And even kind of simpler question, what is crowdfunding? What is fiscal sponsorship? But why, why is this something um, that you should explore? Why is this an option for you? Why is it something that seems so popular? And why should you put your own resources into crowdfunding? 
some highlights around why we should crowdfund is one, there's a low barrier to entry. Um, by that I mean you, anybody can access uh, various crowdfunding platforms. It's you telling your story um, on your platform um, on, or on the platform you've chosen. So that doesn't mean you need um, fancy equipment, you don't need uh, a whole team, even though a team can be helpful. Um, it's simply what do you need and how can you tell your story in a way that connects to your audience. Um, this low barrier to entry um, can help democratize funding um, by allowing a project to directly contribute uh, or connect with the audiences that could contribute to them. That project can be empowered to not have to curtail their message. Um, they don't have to worry about the arbiting eye of a larger organization. Um, what they can do is connect directly to the people who care about their project or their work and appeal to them for support. Um, this allows work that may not be as supported by larger institutions or by huge followings to still get um, funded and still get supported and still build momentum. Speaking of building momentum, um, crowdfunding is an excellent way to get people excited about what you're doing and, and trying to push you toward the goal. Um, part of crowdfunding is not only developing your marketing strategy for the crowdfunding campaign, it is using the energy of the campaign to build your audience, to um, get people excited to let them see people flocking to your online space um, in service of making your work happen. It also rewards your audience, particularly if you've been working on products for a while or if you had the opportunity to build an audience that's been there for you and is committed to what you're doing. Um, crowdfunding campaign is a chance to celebrate them, to say, hey, thanks for, your su for supporting us this long. Here is our tote bag or our coffee mug or something that you helped make possible. Um, it allows them to be ambassadors for the work that they've supported. They can say, hey, this is that product I've been telling you about. These are the people that I love. This is the work that I really support. And I want you to also be a part of it. It allows them to invite other people in. Um, and they can say they were there when. Allowing your audience to have a stake in what you do and the chance to promote and share how they've been involved can be a very motivating factor. So one of the four main, of some of the four main reasons to crowdfund are exercising a low barrier to entry. If you can access the internet, you can access some crowdfunding. Um, it can democratize funding by, uh, again, allowing you to bypass some of the larger institutions that may not be um, in line with your work or that may not be able to see it just yet. Uh, builds momentum by allowing your audience to, to see this energy, to, to connect with your product online, and it rewards them, um, allowing them to be ambassadors for you. It allows them to, to say, look at what I've helped contribute, and this is how it can, this is how you can take it to the next step. So how should I crowdfund? This is hopefully what we'll cover today. Some of our best practices to plan and execute a successful camp crowdfunding campaign. Um, and we'll start with what um, oftentimes people think the first step, step should be. With so many options on the market, this is merely sampling, it's actually best not to focus on the platform, at least not yet. Um, a lot of folks want to start with, well, I'll do the GoFundMe, or I need my Kickstarter, or I need to start at this place. And um, a lot of the best practices we're going to talk about work regardless of platform, and that can help you prepare for a more successful campaign. I like to think that the organizing metaphor around crowdfunding is that it's a party. Um, it's not just an online happening. Um, in the same way that you would uh, plan uh, an in-person event, um, you wanna take that same energy and plan your crowdfunding event. Um, I believe if you plan your campaign using these same principles that you use to plan a party, you can set yourself up for success. And those principles are organize your guests, pick your venue, 
host the party, and say thanks. Organizing your guests in this metaphor means building your audience. You need to start with who you know and who you, who you can activate to support your project. Um, and I think an important distinction is this is a distinction between fans and your target audience. So a fan is any member of your audience who wants to support you. Right? These are the people who know and like you, people who will want you to succeed, sure, but are, are connected to you more personally um, than they may be to the project. Um, and fans are great. You need fans to keep you buoyed, to help bring the work forward, to continue to support you. We love fans. Um, your target audience, however, is a group or groups of people that prefer what you're offering. And for me, the distinction is your fans are one already in your network, they know you, they love you. But when you're trying to get out of your network, when you're trying to expand who could like you, you need to figure out who your audience is for. Um, this is important to remember when crafting your audience, you're not looking to reach everyone. You're looking to reach the people who can find value in what you do. So your fans, like I said, aren't necessarily your target audience. Planning for a crowd camping, crowdfunding campaign is an excellent time to look at who is your target audience? Who do I need to make sure is seeing my campaign? Who do I need to make sure is accessing the material I have to offer? For example, perhaps uh, they aren't located in the community where your work is presented, um, or they don't prefer the type of work you do, a, a fan. So let's say you're from Michigan, like I'm from Michigan, um, but you produce work in LA. While your Michigan friends and family may want to see you succeed and are fans of yours, your work may be created for an LA audience. Uh, so you, don't, you wouldn't look to your Michigan fans to purchase tickets to experience your work. Your Michigan fans can definitely advocate for you. They can be ambassadors for you, but the your target audience, the people you keep trying to reach are the people who can most effectively um, enjoy what you are offering. So we're gonna think of your audience via these tiers. They're organized by degree of separation from you. Core, one, two, three. Best described as you. Your, that red circle in the center is where you sit. It is who you are connected to. It is, um, so you, just as a person, it could be your team, um, but it's, these are the people who are like directly involved in making this happen. Then there's your friends, family, and fans. Again, people who already know and are connected to you, right? Then there's your acquaintances, and these are their friends and family, right? These are people who know somebody who knows you, but may not know it directly um, or may not know you directly or have kind of heard of your work but may not um, be directly involved um, and then lastly is the crowd you actually have to go through each step to get to the next the further people are away from you the more information you'll need to provide to them you'll have to throw more time and resources for each successive circle you should know approximately how many people you and your team can reach in each circle Part of your crowdfunding strategy may be building your audience before you even start your campaign. Um, this will allow you to better, better plan your budget and your goal. Goals should be based on the size of your network. 30% of your goal will be contributed by family and friends. So we're going to talk about budgeting for your project and how that relates to this goal setting for the campaign. So like I just said, 30% of your goal will come from your family and friends. Um, so that will be that, that those tighter circles. Um, the majority of what will happen, the majority of any of your crowdfunding will come from people in your network, which is why it is a helpful strategy to do the work to build your network, to build your audience before you start a campaign. Here are some helpful numbers for setting a goal. So the average donation across any fundraising platform or any crowdfunding platform is $75. The most common donation is $20. 
And here's a great boost. The average donation with fiscal sponsorship is $105. So it shows that there is actually a quantifiable boost uh, to your donors who understand um, that you're fiscally sponsored or they there may be a level of security that they feel when you're fiscally sponsored. But these numbers um, can contribute to you planning your goal. Um, we'll use an example. So let's say that the goal you would like to raise is $7,500. That means you need 100 unique donations. Generally, people who are connected to you, one in four of, those pe of the people you ask will give. So that means in order to get 100 donors, you need 400 people in your network. And I like to be very clear that 400 people in your network is, uh, it can best be described as 400 households or 400 families. Um, frequently, we look at our net networks, we look at our social media followings, um, and we see that we have, you know, thousands of, of friends um, or people who are connected to us, particularly digitally, but they aren't necessarily all discrete households. Um, they are oftentimes, you know, families or people who are connected to each other. Um, and so you want to make sure that you, when counting who you have access to, um, you're looking, um, you're kind of grouping families or, or units together. And of the $7,500 goal, family and friends will contribute just over $2,200. Um, so that is where you want to deepen these connections. Um, this can be a health, helpful roadmap, and you can use your own personal goals um, to see how the finances um, can help support it or what your network can support. Um, an additional type of information uh, to be aware of when you are setting your goal is the type of platform you're on. Um, are you looking to do a keep what you raise campaign or an all or nothing campaign? So a keep what you raise campaign um, is very straightforward in the sense of let's say you have a goal of $10,000 but you only raise eight. Um, it will allow you to keep that eight. Um, this is great for um, things where you're like you're putting on a play and so you can use any amount of money to make it happen right you can there's definitely funds that you need but you know you can make a, a if you're going to make a play for ten thousand dollars you can make a, a a play that has just a little bit less production value for eight thousand dollars but you can still get the thing done or you can make some adjustments the all or nothing platform is best if you're looking to proof a concept to to sheet C proof of concept, excuse me, or um, if you have a like a mini, minimum viable product, let's say you're manufacturing something and there's only so um, you, there's only so few of something you can make. So you have to make $10,000 or you won't be able to get the part that you need manufactured. Um, this is great for garnering interest prior to development um, and to see if this idea is viable. Um, do people want this thing enough for them to invest in making it happen? Are they so interested that they are willing to provide the funds to get it started? Um, and that's a great way to see um, if the audience that you're seeking will support the thing that you want to make. It can feel overwhelming to develop a budget, um, which is why it's best to start with your audience. This will help you determine how much money your network can support. Um, in the same way you wouldn't pick an event venue without knowing how many people need to fit in the space, you don't want to start a crowdfunding campaign without knowing who is in your network. Speaking of budget, um, here are some helpful hints to develop your budget and understand how to communicate those costs. First is that numbers don't have feelings. Your budget should accurately represent the cost to execute your project or organization in the way that you feel it needs to be done. There isn't a right or wrong number. People often say things like, that number feels too high, or doesn't that feel a little low to you? Numbers don't have feelings. They simply tell the story of what it costs to do what you want to do. Your total budget is different from your campaign goal. You need to know how your campaign will support the overall project. 
it's really a good idea to rely on crowdfunding for 100% of your costs. Also, money is not stuff. This is a great thing. Uh, frequently, people think I need to raise X amount of dollars to be able to buy the space, equipment, stuff, and make my project happen. You don't actually need the money. You need the stuff. This is a great opportunity to think of small businesses you could partner with or ask for non-cash donations from. You may be able to get discounts for things in exchange for driving business their way or showcasing their product in your work. Remembering that money is simply a tool to get stuff can help you be more aware of the stuff you actually need. This can inform your budget and this can also inform your crowdfunding goal. Research is your best budgeting tool. You are not expected to know what everything costs to the penny. Your best tool in developing strong, strong budget is research. Call vendors that sell the products you need and see what their prices and payment policies are. Compare prices through internet searches to get an accurate sense of the range of costs. Avoid accounting for the cheapest version of something in your budget. That, dis that deal may disappear, never to be seen again. So now we have gotten the intro, looked at building our audience, um, talked about goal setting and budgeting, and so next would be executing your campaign. First, we'll talk about timing. Crowdfunding is for the short term. Um, it is ideally between um, 30 to 60 days. The sweet spot is really 30 to 45 days. Um, some campaign platforms allow you to go up to 90 days, but ultimately um, the sweet spot is in the 30 to 45 day range. Um, this allows for st uh, your staff stamina. Crowdfunding campaigns actually require a lot of work. Um, they're, there's making new connections, you're trying to get people involved, you're trying to um, make sure it stays top of mind. Um, and so your energy and resources um, can really only hang on for so long. You also um, want to create a sense of urgency um, for your potential donors. Um, they need to know that they need to give and that they need to give you know, now, they need to give in a very brief amount of time. Um, and it helps giving moment. It helps give momentum. If there's more energy, if there's more work going toward this, um, they will um, be more excited, um, and you'll you'll be able to use that momentum to your advantage. Campaigns are generally U-shaped um, in their activity, which means that there's lots of energy in the first and last portions of the campaign with a big dip in the middle. So be sure you're scheduling your campaign during a time where you can be fully engaged with those peak points. If you need a break, the slowest moment should be in the middle, so plan accordingly. You also wish to avoid major holidays and weekends. Uh, people are more likely to contribute when at computers during the work week. So you would ideally like to launch to the public on a Monday or a Tuesday. Um, you also want to avoid the months of January and August, which we'll talk about, um, because people are on vacation. Um, you want people to be engaged and online and, and frankly staring at their phones or their computers um, so that they can see your content and um, contribute. Along those lines, you're avoiding January and August because frequently people have, um, in January, they're burned out from the very large giving season that is uh, December and the holidays. Um, in August, just people are on vacation trying to do what they can do um, to get away from their computers before Labor Day, before the summer is over. Um, as a result, people give less in those times. They are more focused on what they're doing. So um, it's important to consider that when you're considering your timing. The next thing to think about is what's your story? What are you telling people? Why are you encouraging them to give? Um, the three things that your story um, should have are what do you do? And this is literally your primary activity. I always like to say you should be explaining this to a very smart eight-year-old. So we produce modern dance performances, we produce theater, we, I'm an installation artist who works in these mediums or in these forms. Um, this is just a literal specific 
detail of what you do. What is the activity? Um, second is who do you do it for? This is identifying your audience as specifically as you can. Who benefits? Is this for students in your neighborhood? Is this for uh, female playwrights? Is this for um, your personal aesthetic? Is this for the theatrical canon? Like, who do you think benefits from you making the work that you make? And third is what's your true north? What is where are you trying to arrive at? What are you striving for? This is the big picture. This is the, I do this work because um, this is what drives me. This is what I think it can do to, to change the world or why I think this is, it needs to happen right now. Um, your true north is again, what guides you to do the things you're doing and who, and, and for the people you're doing it for. So when you're telling your story, one of the things that you need is a pitch video. Um, Kickstarter specifically has found that 50% of campaigns with a video reach their goal, while campaigns without videos only have a 30% chance of being funded. Um, and to be fair, this more and more a video of some sort is becoming standard. It is um, expected with a crowdfunding campaign. Um, some tips are keep it personal. People give to people. You and or your team should be in the video. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. It does not have to be super polished. Um, it just needs to be a, a heartfelt and honest conversation between the people making the work uh, to that audience. You should also keep it short. It should be between one and three minutes long. Um, it's simply about communicating as briefly and as effectively as you can why what you're doing matters, why um, what you're going to make can have an impact and why your donors can help make that impact uh, stronger. Um, in this short time, this, like I said, one to three minutes, the first 30 seconds are crucial. Um, you don't want to start with 30 seconds of silence or on a on a totally black screen. You want to get people in quickly as possible um, because even though it should be one to three minutes, you, they don't they can't wait until minute two to understand why this is important. So as much as you can do sooner and earlier in the video, the better. You should also showcase the work if you. Um, can show a, if there's a, a work in progress or if there's a piece of it or a work sample, so something where they can see the type of work that's happening or how it can be um, told, um, that would be best. Showcase what you're doing so that um, people can connect to it. And lastly, in our pitch video, ask for money. Um, if you ask for support, people will love to support you and still not donate. Um, so this be very clear about how a donation can support um, making the work happen, can support the impact, can um, expand what you do. And then we can get into rewards. Um, there are a variety of ways to provide rewards on a crowdfunding campaign, and this is a great moment for your creativity to flourish. Um, one of the things that people like uh, to offer is access. Um, access is affordable, so can they, you know, have a video chat to see a rehearsal, or can they um, just have a conversation or even like get into a Facebook group or or something that is uh, allows them a little bit of a sneak peek into what's happening before um, they uh, so they feel like part of the group part of the process um, there are also products so this is where you know I think what people are most comfortable with or are most familiar with and this is the tote bag or the coffee mug or the mouse pad or the pencil or the t-shirt or the something that has a logo and that has um, a, a, that is a chance to brag about what they've contributed to and these are great uh, 
to incentivize your donors, but they aren't the only way to incentivize people. Um, and they can also be expensive and uh, a little unwieldy to ship, um, to provide it to your audiences. So you wanna be very thoughtful about what products you're offering and you wanna make sure that the products, if, if that's what you're doing, um, are for your higher level donors. Um, because people want the items not because they want items. People aren't buying coffee mugs. If they do, they would they would go to a, a random big box store and buy a coffee mug. They're buying a piece of your process. They're buying uh, a chance to brag about what they've done or to a, chance to a chance to talk about your work. And so putting that in the higher sections allows people who want to evangelize about you uh, the chance to do so and encourages um, that higher investment. You can also provide experiences. Uh, so experiences like coming to the set of the film or again, having a private conversation with some of the creative team. Um, what are things that uh, don't overtax your staff or collaborators, but can allow someone who cares about your work to experience it, to see something that they may not regularly see? And ultimately anything, again, your creativity um, can make uh, a huge impact for allowing people to know what you do. So, you know, think outside the box. What are things that can be offered? What are things that are, um, not that just have to be sold, but what are things that can be um, given um, that somebody would appreciate? So we've talked about a lot of things. Now is the time to consider platform. We're gonna revisit what we talked about. Um, the timing and video and rewards are things that are needed for every platform. Um, and so we'll talk about what is specific to each of the platforms we're gonna go through. We're just gonna talk briefly about some of them um, and see some of the difference that, differences that can inform which you, try, you choose to use. So the first is Kickstarter. It is clearly one of the bis biggest and it is an all or nothing platform. So either you make your goal or you don't get any of the funds. If you don't make your goal, the contributors keep their money and it's back to the drawing board. This is ideal, um, as I said earlier, for product launches or things that have a manufacturing member minimum or things where you need to hit a specific bottom before you can begin. Uh, it's also great for proof of, proof of concept where you're like, I have this idea, I need some more funding to figure out if it's viable or figure out it's something that can be of service. Those are the two types of projects that really do well on Kickstarter. We at Fractured Atlas have launched our own crowding pla crowdfunding platform, excuse me, called Fundraising by Fractured Atlas. It is a keep what you raise platform. Right now it is only available to our fiscally sponsored projects, um, which is great because there are no additional fees and no additional barriers to entry to have access to the crowdfunding campaign. Um, and if you're fiscally sponsored, you can get started on developing a crowdfunding campaign through us immediately. Um, however, because it is through us, it is for a project with an artistic focus. Um, we can only currently work with artist projects, um, but we do have a very broad and inclusive definition of arts. So there is a little bit of something for everyone. Next is Patreon. Um, and Patreon is actually a subscription model, uh, which may be closer to a monthly donation model, but it is definitely about content for fee. Um, it's mostly for long-term engagement with an audience um, where the audience acts as your patron and can provide you with a steady stream of funds in exchange for content. This is ideal for quick content generators. So people frequently use it for YouTube channels or writers who write short form content, um, illustrators who take commissions. It's people who can generate content quickly and, and consistently. Uh, finally um, is Seed and Spark. Now Seed and Spark is also a keep what you raise platform, um, that, but this one is ideal for film and media distribution. It's great for products that are looking for distributors um, and it's a unique feature is it offers direct purchase donations. So you can actually have an equipment list available on Seed and Spark and, and as opposed to a donor giving you dollars, donors can directly purchase the equipment you're looking for, um, props, costumes, lighting equipment, anything that you're requesting. Um, 
So the crowdfunding landscape is vast. There are a lot of different platforms out there. So feel free to shop and see what is available to and for you to ask questions. I just wanted to highlight these four platforms to see that there are different kinds of ways um, that you can uh, use the crowd to fund. I want us to close out with a little bit of the myths of crowdfunding. Um, these are things that um, can hinder people from planning appropriately. So first, um, the first myth is angel donors. Um, you will know approximately at least 85% of your donors. Um, there aren't really people who kind of troll these crowdfunding sites looking to just randomly drop large amounts of money to products they aren't connected to. Um, the more you are taking care of and engaged with the people who are in your network and the more that you are expanding your network to try to pull more people in and take care of them, the better. But planning for a angel donor to come in and swoop and like push you over the edge um, is not a sustain sustainable or successful strategy. Um, another myth is that you can set it and forget it. Crowdfunding is something that needs to have a plan for engagement almost every day. When you're in the middle in that U-shaped you know, dip portion, um, you can definitely back off just a little bit, but it should be reserving your energy to plan for how are you going to end strong because the majority of your donations will come in at the in the first week and then the last week. So you wanna make sure that you are communicating as con consistently as possible, that you are reaching out to new people, that you're expanding who can be um, available or to be reached with your messaging throughout your campaign. You also don't wanna offer diamonds for donors. Um, what you are creating, the, the work that you are asking to be funded, is valuable and important and interesting. You don't have to also offer diamonds and cars and tote bags, coffee mugs, computers um, in service of getting people to donate. People if you're doing the work that is valuable, if you are doing work that you believe in, other people can also believe in it. So spend your time focusing on how are you telling the story? How are you communicating to people that this is what needs to happen? As opposed to thinking about all of the things you need to give for them to, um, to do this. And the last myth is that huge goals will equal huge dollars, which isn't, it just isn't true. So many people are like, well, if I need $50,000, that's what I should ask for, and then people will just get you there. Um, and it's not true. People, particularly in crowdfunding, want to see campaigns be successful. And so sometimes they'll wait. They'll see how close you are, and then they'll want to be part of the group that gets you over the edge. But they're not going to, if, you, if they feel like you can't make that goal, they aren't going to um, contribute. They're going to say, oh, well, this is just not going to make it, so we're going to, you know, we'll catch the next one. Um, you want to really go through your budgeting and planning and pick a goal that you that feels reasonable for your um for you that feels reasonable for your network um and that feels reasonable for for what you can do and maybe set it just a little lower so let's say if your network can sustain like nine thousand dollars asking for eight or even 7,500 and seeing if you can get pushed over is helpful. Um, will give people encouragement. They can see they can, they like to, you know, blow past the finish line. But asking for $20,000 if you think your network can sustain only eight or nine um, will be a little discouraging for your network. And they will feel like, well, maybe you can't make it. And lastly, in our party, we've organized our guests, picked our venue, hosted the party. You should always remember to say thanks. Uh, crowdfunding is about relationships. Um, 
any type of, of fundraising is about relationships. So if somebody gave, acknowledge them, get them their gifts and, and build the relationship going forward. Keep them um, updated on what you're doing. Let them know that um, you appreciate what they've given and that you appreciate them supporting your work. Um, so that is our crowdfunding webinar. Thank you all so much for your time. I see that we've uh, got some questions in our Q&A, um, so I'll start answering them. Feel free to type in either chat box or the Q&A box. Um, and um, thank you again for listening uh, as we talked about crowdfunding for your artistic practice. Um, so the first question is, how many times can we sensibly run campaigns and not burn out our network? That's a good question. Um, and it some ways depends on the seasons of things that you're doing. Um, I would strongly suggest no more than twice a year, but that depends on if there are like a spring season and a fall season. Um, but even then, that can be um, a little a little tight for people. A annual campaigns are not um, out of the question. That can be uh, frequently uh, a possibility. Um, but it also depends on um, how often you're producing something new. I think uh, you should definitely only run a campaign, you know, for the same project. Um, definitely no more than once a year, but it, it depends on the project. If it's like a film that you, you know, you start, you did pre-production and so you did something and then, you know, a year or two years from now you can do post-production, like yes, you can, you can definitely bookend campaigns for the same project, um, but you really may just need to talk to your audience and see how, um, how often you have something new to, to create urgency around and to fundraise for. Um, next question is there, um, uh, is there a webinar for building one's portfolio? Um, there, it, we do not have a webinar specifically for building our portfolio, partially because um, the uh, our portfolio is almost always it, it for a particular type of opportunity. Um, that is definitely something I guess we could talk more specifically about, um, but we don't have um, a portfolio building uh, content. Um, but if you can always email us at support at fractureatlas.org or give us a call and we can maybe talk through what could feasibly uh, be included in a portfolio, but it would very much depend on what it is for. Um, this next question is, what is the best way to increase your supporters? Um, and there may be some struggles around getting people to open mail. Um, the best way to increase supporters, um, and there, there isn't really a one best way, but it is important to provide them with new content and to let your supporters feel like you're actively investing in the relationship. Um, are you offering new content in the mail that they may not be opening? Or are you just constantly like asking for support or for funds? Um, Think about the ways you like to be approached. What is interesting to you? Are you um, providing like monthly or so updates? Are your updates regularly regular? Um, if you're working in a particular subject area, are you meeting people who are also working in that subject area? Who are you? Who are you listening to? Um, I find that to be a great way to start building your supporters. Is seeing who is out operating in spaces that are similar to you, and how can you make connections with them, see where their supporters are coming from. Is there a community that you could be more involved in? Um, because for anyone in, 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 in any type of audience building, it, nobody appreciates when somebody like comes into their space and just starts asking for resources, right? People want to be acknowledged and viewed um, and respected in whatever space they're in. And the way to do that is to listen first, see who is in this space, and then um, build relationships from there, have honest and open uh, conversations. Uh, 
I I understand. Um, there is crowdfunding is difficult. Um, there is a a a, a comment saying that we've started a conversation uh, or started a crowdfunding campaign that is difficult. And and crowdfunding is it is a a difficult thing to do because it it requires maximizing your relationships and it's it can be difficult to build new audiences in the middle of a campaign because again the same way that nobody likes to be called like nobody likes to be called asking for money if you haven't heard from someone in six months or a year um, it's almost it's difficult to in the middle of a campaign asking for money also be building a relationship um, a lot of what crowdfunding needs to happen happens before the crowdfunding campaign starts. It happens when you are connecting with people. It happens when you are telling people why what you do matters. It happens before the campaign is where you're going to maximize on the momentum that you've been building. Um, and, and once you get into the campaign, then you can start saying, this is what I need from you. Um, it just it can be hard to do in the moment um so that's why a, a strong plan and a base of support that you can go to um is the first step in a crowdfunding campaign it's building your audience it's making connections are there any other questions well we offer um, a series of webinars. We try to do these um, regularly, um, most often on Tuesday nights. Um, they're also available at our uh, fiscal sponsorship webinars uh, page. Um, so you can find recorded versions of past webinars there. Um, these are all the ones we have to offer. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to email us at support at fracturedatlas.org, um, or you can give us a call at 888-692-7878. Thank you all very much for your time. Um, and if you need anything else, feel free to reach out. Enjoy your evenings.